Welcome back to Adelaide Entrepreneurs. This is the show where we interview entrepreneurs from Adelaide about what they've done, what they're doing, and uh, what we can learn from them. Uh, my guest for this show is Stuart Austin from Cindio.co. G'day, lovely Stuart. Thanks for joining us. Lovely to lovely to be on air and uh, be part of this process with you. It's fantastic. Thanks for having me along. Right. No worries. Um, can you uh, explain to us to 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 get started uh, what your startup, Cindio, is? Sure. Um, Cindio is basically dealing with two significant problems we face. Uh, one is that as a student, if you go through study and learn all these skills and um, different techniques for solving problems, you'll come to industry at the end of that and ask for work, which is the natural progression. So I do my study and then I ask for work. And often what ha happens is that they ask if you've got experience and you say, no, I don't have experience, how do I get experience? And they say, well, you're going to have to find it somewhere else. So as a student, you're quite stuck. And um, some students go back to study, others drop out completely, and basically there's a real disconnect between learnt work and university teaching and industry standard skill sets. The other problem is that recruiting people is incredibly difficult, and there are lots of systems that sit between organisations and the people they want to recruit which don't work that well. Um, and I'm sure most of you have experienced these at some times and uh, they've probably driven you to do your own projects more often than not as well. So Cindio is essentially the system that sits between learners, essentially those people that are studying and organisations that are seeking to find talent and connects them up. So. Cool. Yeah. yeah, that's a good good little introduction to get us started. Cool. Um, how okay, I can see it's uh, certainly I, I can see where the problem is, um, and uh, I've been in the same situation of of going and looking for work, and and they say you know what what experience have you had, and you say you know none or not very much, just out of uni. Oh, you know. Yeah, you have to get some experience. It's a chicken and egg thing. So there's definitely, obviously, a problem there. Um, how did you, how did you get the idea? To, was it just something you sort of thought about why you were studying, or was there a specific catalyst for the idea? Sure. Um, my own journey over the last ten years has been quite involved. I've studied five different degrees. I've worked in many different industries, and I've gone for lots of different work. And I guess. Over that time, I realised that there were serious issues with the education system as a whole, and, and specifically this particular issue we're dealing with now. So, in terms of where I got the idea, um, my own experience was definitely a catalyst for looking into this this more um, more thoroughly this whole problem, um, and and I really started to focus on it probably in two thousand and eight, I think was when, when I really decided that I wanted to do something serious about this, this problem. Um, and then the idea really started to take hold in a serious fashion um, through 2011 probably. But it's gone through lots of change in that time. Um, the other inspiration, if you will, for the idea has been talking to pretty well everyone and finding that they have problems in similar areas or the same areas whether they're an organisation or a student. So it's just so widespread that it was sort of unavoidable um, and so difficult to solve that um, I don't, that's why I think we don't have systems that work because it's such a tricky problem. And, you know, I like a good problem. I like a bit of a challenge, so. Uh, yep, yep. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That, that uh, sort of le uh, leads nicely into my next question, which was, <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, uh, how did you know it was a good idea? Was it just from this this process of talking to people and seeing that they're also having those problems, or was there? How did I know it was a good idea? I remember one time. One time I spoke to a university careers um, guidance person. They were essentially their role was to help me figure out which courses I wanted to study at uni when I was doing my masters in computer science. And I said to her, look, I, I, um, partly I'd like to reform the education system. And I got this response where she just, I think, pretended she hadn't heard what I just said and went on as though there was nothing said like that. Um, 
I knew it was a good idea when my employment uh, contract was severed as a result of the idea because I saw it as a threat to their internal graduate recruitment system. So I, I had a job lined up with, with quite a big organisation and they saw this project as a threat and that really validated the concept. Um, but apart from that, it's been validated by universities, by students everywhere, um, by organisations and there's not really any person that hasn't thought it was a good idea. Um, so, and, and I suppose the biggest, the biggest thing that told me it's a good idea is the fact that there's a real problem and it needs to be solved and it's, it's a fairly obvious problem in some ways. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, can I just drill in on, on that about the, um, uh, the, the internal career finding system? So this was at university. Uh, they have a system for finding jobs for graduates and they, do they get some sort of uh, benefit from that? Um, universities do have internal job finding systems. Um, the conflict of interest that I found was with an external private company. So that wasn't oh, right. with the university. So that was yep. a full-time contract outside of university. Um, but the universities do have internal graduate recruitment systems and they try to connect industry with students in much the same way Cindio does. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. Um, uh, so I guess a related question to whether you know it's a good idea or not or how do you know it's a good idea is um, are there any competitors out there and I suppose the the one of the existing competitors uh, in that space would be the um, the agency, the job agency that's that's tasked with making that connection. Um, sure. Is your solution uh, going to be competing directly with them? Was it on a different plane or and, and are there any other competitors that are sort of in your space? Absolutely. It's a, it's a very good question. We, we do have lots of competitors, um, but not directly. And what I mean by that is that recruitment agencies, for example, we could technically replace everything that they do with the system. But a recruitment agency could actually use the system themselves to find talent if they wish. So by introducing this system, we're not completely um, challenging what they do. We're saying we've got something that can actually help your job. Uh, for recruitment agencies in particular, they've got incentives in the wrong areas. They're basically um, incentivized, if you will, to, to put more people on their books or give more applicants. So the more applicants they find, the more money they make. So they're less concerned with finding exactly the right person and more concerned with volume, which means the people using the recruitment agency doesn't find who they want necessarily. Um, and, and in a sense, we are competitive because we want to break down that process and place that control back in the hands of organisations and students directly who are the people who actually benefit from each other. Um, so, so we are competitive to a degree with recruitment agencies. Um, we've got programs like LinkedIn, um, 99 Designs, other project sort of seeding platforms which are on the periphery of being competitive, um, there are certainly areas that we'd like to move into, but they're not our primary target market. So, um, yeah, we're, we're hoping to be able to establish ourselves well before we get into that territory. Um, career platforms, resume writing industries and things like that are more direct competition. Um, so yeah, I, I think as we develop, we'll be making lots of friends and lots of enemies probably, but that's the nature of change and the sort of problem we're tackling. So um, we'll see, we'll see. There's cool. certainly lots of people trying to solve parts of the problems we're doing. Yeah, absolutely. That I mean, makes sense. I, yeah, that makes sense, definitely. Um, uh, it's interesting being in an industry with so many different uh, businesses that are that sort of touch your business in different ways and that it's semi-competitive or really competitive and mm -hmm. uh, must be, has, probably has its challenges and sort of rewards in that there's uh, lots of problems you can solve but also, you know, lots of, lots lots of challenges to tread things. on. Yeah. Lots of toes <laughs> to tread on which is always yeah. interesting. Yeah. Um, how long have you been working on this uh, project for? So I guess you had the idea some time ago as, as you mentioned in your sort of introduction uh, section. Um, yeah. But how long since you sort of got started with uh, developing something? Yeah, sure. Um, 
Really, really since 2009, the, towards the end of 2009, it was starting to become a lot more serious. Um, at that point, I had no idea what it would turn into, no idea how serious it would become. It was just a really big problem domain that I was starting to jump into. Um, in 2012, at the start of 2012, I pitched this concept at a late startup weekend and started, uh, ran a team of eight people, I think approximately eight people over the weekend and that was a really good experience but we didn't particularly make any headway with the project itself. Um, just realised that it was quite complex. So the serious start to the project would have been at the end of 2009 and then it became much more serious and, and levelled up if you will in 2012 Halfway through 2012, I deferred my master's degree and then um, at the start of 2013, I gave up full-time employment to pursue it full-time. So it's sort of, it's notched up in seriousness progressively since 2009 uh, to where we are now. And what stage would you say the, uh, the business is at the moment? We're at the stage of getting people on board, getting people signed up testing out the system and we're starting to do a bit of marketing um, and get editorial reviews with people as well which is fantastic. Uh, we're currently looking for certain people to come on the team um, to help us get the system fully built. So we did build and design a version of the system towards the end of last year um, but as often happens with these types of programs the complexity changes and the problem domains evolve so we've had to re-architect the system basically. So yes, at the moment I wear about 10 hats, um, but really we're at the stage of getting more people on board and taking it further. Some point down the track we'll probably be looking at investment as well, probably around mid-year I'd say. So um, All right. yeah, exciting yeah. times. Definitely, definitely. Um, I'm going to do sort of stop the progression we're on now and, and, and we'll go back um, okay. to before before you started the business. I want to get a bit, a bit more of an idea of what you were doing before and perhaps before it got, became really more serious as you just sort of uh, gone over there. So uh, yeah. what were you doing before you sort of started working on it? Um, before I started working on this business I was looking for work myself in the um, particularly the entertainment industry with concept design and that kind of thing. I was uh, studying various degrees, so study was quite full on. Um, just before really taking this seriously, I was getting married as well, so setting up home and family life. So they were all, they were all pretty big things. Um, and also with my wife, we started a flower business at the end of 2012 also. So alongside this project, there's also been a more, a more of a bricks and mortar business um, sort of starting. And, um, we started selling flowers in Handorf actually. We popped up a little stall and would sell flowers to people on the sidewalk and from that we've got weddings and now we're putting other people on the books and we're starting to get a website and things like that. So hopefully we can move down into the city and get more of a presence there. Um, so that's been really good. Yeah, very exciting and enjoyable. Yeah, interesting. So, um, are you, do you perceive there could be a conflict or some problems with trying to run two businesses at the same time, with the flower business and uh, your and Cindy? Yeah. Or absolutely, yeah, without doubt. Um, and as a result, I've given sort of ownership and direction of that over to my wife Esty. So she now runs Austin Bloom. Um, and is responsible for all the contracts and the quotes and all that sort of thing. And I help out with the design side of it, design side of things. Um, I'd like to, I'd like to do more, but um, stress levels just get way too high. So one business is quite enough at a time, I think. Yeah. Well, I guess um, as an entrepreneur, you saw an opportunity or a problem that needed solving in in the flower industry, and uh, I guess you couldn't. Uh, help yourself getting in there if, even if you had another business already on the go. Absolutely. Yeah, there's, uh, to be quite frank, no good flowers in the Adelaide Hills, so we decided to do something about that. 
Ah, uh, cool. Yeah, that's uh, a, a connect. Another connection that we have, um, just for my listeners, uh, fill in there. I'm also from the hills, so um, uh, mentions of Harndorf and mentions of uh, <laughs> other local things, and uh, I think we saw each other on the bus one time. So yeah, it's uh, nice to be talking to a, a local as well as well as, uh, as well as being Adelaide, uh, a, a, a closer local in the Adelaide dweller. hills. Yeah, hills dweller. Yeah, it's a different different breed, definitely. <laughs> Yeah. Um, okay, it's very interesting the, um, the having that, the other business as well. I hadn't realized that you'd actually started it so recently as well. So, mm. um, and that's ticking along nicely. Uh, I guess that would be a, a good thing for bringing in some revenue to help you build the, the Cyndios as, as well. Absolutely. Yeah, which, absolutely. Which is probably somewhere where people would struggle uh, often. When, when mm. they, yeah, I'll talk about started. that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. Uh, how did you? Um, now you've got a bit of a team. How did you meet your initial team for for this uh, project? Sure. Uh, a couple of the fellows that started work um, back in two thousand and nine. I knew from my days of studying at uni. Um, one of them had a technical background, and one of them was more a financial type of fellow. Um, so through through 2012, after Startup Weekend, the team sort of expanded to eight and then back down to six fairly quickly after the Startup Weekend process. And then we stripped the team right back to just three people, which was which was myself, the technical lead, and the financial financial lead as well. So Will was the a fellow called Will was the technical lead, and James was the financial lead. And um, through 2012, those two were basically the core team with myself, and we went through a reasonable, reasonable amount of development and thinking and trying ideas and all this sort of stuff through 2012. Um, so Will, I met when doing a game development project actually at university. He was studying with sound and um, atmosphere and that type of thing, and I was doing the visual design. And James was a friend of mine from a while back who was interested in helping out and saw there being a real problem in this area. Uh, now the team has changed slightly. So we now have a front-end developer called Andrew on board. Uh, Will is no longer with us and James is um, helping out in some capacity but less so than he was before. So, um, And the team's going to evolve and change. So it's been quite a dynamic process. Um, and maybe some of the old members that used to be involved will come back in some capacity down the track. We're just not sure. So that's a sort of overall big picture of how we met people. I suppose 2012 Startup Weekend was the real point where it became an, an official team, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to just drill in on a couple of points you mentioned in there. It's interesting, or from my my perspective and my my experience with the business is. It's all solo, so the talks of teams and co-founders and things like that uh, yeah. is interesting um, to me, but also probably to other people. Um, so it sounds like it was fairly fluid in, in that you had um, the time before Startup Weekend, and then you had more people, and then you've gone down to less, and it's as you said, it's changing, and it could change some more in the future. Do you have any tips or any sort of uh, experiences from that uh, to make sure that you're keeping... Um, all of your ducks in a row, like your legal things. Do you have like a, some sort of partnership agreement in place, or mm. do you? And and did you have to change that constantly, or when you're bringing on new team members, were they uh, being employed, or how did that sort of work? Yeah, absolutely. Good question and very tricky to answer. Basically, it's been quite a difficult process. So all the, the legal side of things and keeping people on board, figuring out the um, involvement that different people have. What, what I've found is that as a project becomes more serious, the commitment of certain people gets really um, shown up for what it really is. So ideas are good because they're easy to commit to, they're easy to be involved in and they're easy to put effort towards. But as soon as it becomes a seriously commercial uh, pursuit, where things need to happen and stuff needs to get done and you need to start taking risks, then 
um, the dynamics of a team can really change. Um, advice. I initially wanted to get the illegal structure locked down really tight early on in the game so we knew where everyone was. But in retrospect, if I had done that, now I would be regretting it because the roles of everyone have changed so much. So I think it's good to get agreements and it's good to get sort of expectation of duties um, down in written form if you can. Um, I didn't do that up front. But I think probably I would be reluctant to commit to a legal structure and equity structure and things like that um, without having serious commitments from the different people on the team. So basically I would wait for someone to be quite invested in the project and invested time-wise and taking risks with their own financial situation before I would get um, sort of paperwork signed, so to speak. There are different ways that you can um, there are different ways that you can go about making things equitable and fair, things like that. But at the end of the day, if a project goes nowhere, everyone's fine because they learned something, they were happy to put towards it and, and everything was good. But if it does go somewhere and there's money involved and there's a chance that they can have a piece of the pie, but things haven't been clearly defined, then you're in really deep water. So you want to get your legal structure done um, probably prior to the point of serious commercialization, because at that point you'll know how involved people are how much they're willing to give and whether it's actually real or not um, for them. It's still a work in progress for myself. I'm still learning about the best way to do it. So there's probably no one way. Um, but it's, yeah, you know, talk to me, ask questions. I can share advice, but um, don't be rash for sure. Don't be rash. You know, ask advice from different people and don't partner with the first person that comes along either. You need to choose your team wisely. So, nice. I think there's uh, some, some good tips in there um, for mm. people who are thinking of starting businesses with with a team or with multiple people. Um, one yeah. other point I wanted to just uh, follow up on from uh, your earlier a bit before about talking about startup weekend. Um, I've not actually been to any my, myself. Um, I spoke to Michael Reed, uh, one of the mm. drones to the co-founders in, in one of my earlier interviews and he uh, sort of raved about it and I, I'm interested in, in hearing your thoughts on um, uh, some of the after effects or results of something, something like Startup Weekend where you said you had some team members sort of come on almost because you worked on your business idea in the actual uh, event and then they, you had some sort of team members come on from that. Uh, is that uh, a good way do you think to find people or is it do you think it's better to keep it more sort of contained as the event itself and then not sort of carry on with things afterwards? Yeah. Thoughts? My thoughts would be that Startup Weekend is particularly good to try ideas and test things out, but not something that you are very serious about. Um, very serious pursuits do come out of Startup Weekends, but that's a sort of bottom-up process, if you will. So for me, what I did was I took a really serious concept serious idea which is Cindio now to the startup weekend and tried to see if we could get things to work on that but I think um, which was good because I met some people that are in similar spaces and wanted to be involved but they're now no longer involved so it's not really a good measure of whether someone's going to come on board or stick stick with you with regards to a particular project however if you're trying out ideas and just having fun and connecting with people um, you can learn a lot from other people, you can learn a lot from the processes and you can learn a lot from the intensity of the situation alongside the uh, connections with various people in industry and, and other people. So yeah, you can certainly find talent. Um, you can also find, I, I would put on a wary hat when I go to a startup weekend, I would just be fairly clear and just be able to see through through the ideas and through the people and actually engage and connect and there's absolutely some gold there to connect with um, and there's also some 
pretty far off ideas as well. But it's all good fun, you know. It's all part of the weekend, and I'd, I'd recommend it absolutely um, to give it a try if you haven't before, uh, because you realise there are other people that are developing things and doing things and really entrepreneurial and that kind of that kind of thing as well. So um, you can learn a lot from other people. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for that. Uh, I think I was already fairly cool. convinced, but um, that's it's always nice to have some <laughs> some extra encouragement. Yeah, um, do it. Nick. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's have a look here at um, my next question is um, about some challenges that you've faced. We've already talked about a few, but um, can you single out maybe a few challenges that you've faced and and how what you did to sort of overcome those challenges? Yeah, sure. I think the first the first problem. One of the most pressing problems with, or one of the most pressing challenges is financial. So how you actually sustain yourself and your family through the process of developing something. Um, that's one of the biggest challenges I've faced and certainly that's caused a lot of stress. Um, the reality is if you've got a bit of a buffer and you can actually support yourself well through a couple of years, giving yourself a chance to try something, then you'll be in a good position. If you're trying to find work and do other things at the same time and fully invest time into this project that you're running, then you'll struggle. It can be done, but um, at, at some point you have to make sacrifices as well, and that's partly the entrepreneurial way. And I think if you're passionate enough about what you're doing and the enjoyment that it brings you, then Financial concerns are very real, but you figure out a way to get through them. Um, have I overcome that? Just in dribs and drabs. Yeah, ongoing process. So it would be nice one bad day to look back on this and go, well, that was a good learning experience. So, um, so that's the first problem. The, well, the second first challenge, sorry, the second challenge I would say is the chicken and egg challenge that we've had with this whole project. So it goes something like this. Do we build the system first or do we get investment or do we find people or do we market first or, you know, to get people on board, we need a system working or we need a marketing plan. To get a marketing plan, we need money. How do we get money? Well, we need investors and investors want people on board the system. So how do we get people on board the system? So those sorts of problems are kind of routine for routine challenges for startups and I think um, one of my mentor, he said, look, at the end of the day, your passion is one of the most important things and you just have to fail forwards. So you fail at one thing and then you fail at another thing and you fail, 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 fail and eventually you find the right thing to do. And that's, that's, that's partly how it works. You just try lots of things, talk to lots of people and eventually you find the right way. Um, so... Uh, challenge number three was changing the team. So I've alluded that to that before. Uh, if you haven't been through the process of changing the team or being responsible for other people, it can be a quite stressful thing um, because you're responsible for other people. You know, emotional issues come into it. Things can turn personal. Just normal, everyday um, hiring and firing of people, if you will, except with startups, there's really hiring and firing because there's really money. But the, the same principles apply. Um, so I found that quite challenging and I've had to grow a lot through that, dealing with people. So prepare to learn. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for, no. thanks for sharing those challenges. Uh, and the, certainly the money one um, uh, is something that I'm sure lots of people struggle with, uh, or everybody. <laughs> yeah, and um, you know and the that. team one as well. Uh, certain certain types of businesses. Yeah. Um, I've just got a f couple of questions left before we we wrap up. Sure. Uh, I wanted to touch on marketing. You mentioned it a few times throughout the interview so far, um, and you're just in the early stages now, trying to get uh, some some sort of some initial users and things. Yeah. So That's um. Right. What what kind of marketing strategies? Um, or let's put it this way: How did you? How have you sort of decided on your marketing strategies? And, yep. uh, what what's kind of your initial thoughts on on marketing for for your project? 
talking to people is really important. So face to face contact, personalised contact and really spreading the idea and getting as many people interested as possible is I would say the first port of call because they are also your first um, user testing base if you will. So I started talking to people years ago and those networks are now coming to fruition with this project but you know I'm literally speaking to people that I first made contact with four years ago and talking now about this thing that I was talking about back then and suddenly it makes sense. So in terms of marketing and outreach, talk to people and talk to lots of people and eventually you'll figure out how to um, drill down to the people that you need and, and what you're doing. Um, Did you do that in a, a targeted way, like going specifically to places where you knew you know, the target market w were or was it more general like going to sort of networking events? And finding people that way. It was reasonably targeted. Um, to to be honest, it's obviously much more targeted now. Where the where Cindio is now, it's driving a lot of the focus. But back then, it was. I was sort of talking to anyone and everyone that I could, and not everyone was worth talking to, so to speak. But they were still valuable, you know, because they helped me refine then who I needed to talk to next and things like that. Um, so networking events, networking events are good, um, but I would say that targeting targeting specific people is really important. So, for instance, now with Cindy, I'm targeting the heads of the ICT departments at universities, which is a very specific demographic, and there's maybe three people in that position. So you need to drill down and figure out why you're targeting people and then figure out what they get from the um, conversation and how you go from there. Um, net, uh, word of mouth, I think networking through other people is really important. Um, yeah, it, it does take time to find the right people for sure. And especially in Adelaide, if you're an Adelaide entrepreneur, then yeah, you've got to really walk the walk and um, get your idea out there. So it just takes time. Awesome. And, and when, when you sort of, uh, once you get rolling, do you have uh, some plans, if you, if you don't mind sharing, that is uh, about marketing down, down the road? Uh, I mean, do you, I, I would assume once you got going, you'd want to take this, uh, you know, Australia-wide and maybe even worldwide uh, eventually. Yeah. Yes and yes. Uh, do you have some, some ideas on how you might uh, uh, feel that expansion from a marketing perspective? perspective? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in the very near future, we are going to get some editorial articles in a particular Adelaide magazine. I won't say what right now. Um, but that will be sort of an exclusive exposure on what's in the and what we're doing and also our predicted launch dates. Um, and once we launch the system later this year, as in the fully working system that everyone can interact with, um, we'll be running serious press releases and print campaigns and over over the next few months we're going to develop a robust online strategy as well which involves a development blog, um, Twitter, Facebook, all, uh, Google, um, all those sorts of, you know, all those sorts of platforms. We're maybe even going to put a, um, a project on change.org and see if we can really drive traffic. Um, What's uh, change.org? Change.org is a system or a platform where you can put up projects of political or social, like socio-economic nature or if there are issues that you see and you want to get people to sign petitions and be involved and then use that as a lever to, event, um, to make change in certain areas you can. Um, so check it out, that's change.org. Um, so if we can get exposure and people on board that way, that would be really good as well because we can then use those numbers and signatures to basically talk to other people and say that these people think it's serious. So um, Kickstarter we've thought about connecting with. Um, online marketing. Yes, work in progress. Um, 
lots of talking to people at the moment, but more and more viral marketing eventually as well. So ways for people to suggest projects and to be involved to other friends and things like that. Um, when we hit that point, we'll be really, really starting to move. So, yeah. Awesome. Uh, you're obviously in the early days at the moment. That's in terms right. Of, uh, uh, getting out there, so I'm sure the marketing strategy will, just, will change as you will yeah, realize what works, what doesn't work, and yeah. And, uh, going back to what you said before about failing forward, I think that makes uh, that makes sense. Within a marketing strategy as well, just sort of figuring out as you go along, learning. Yeah. Um, that almost pretty much brings us to the end of the interview. Um, is there any yeah. advice that maybe you can leave us with uh, for Adelaide entrepreneurs? Uh, some general advice that um, might be able to help them along their way, along their journey. Absolutely, Nick. I would love to. Um, <laughs> so, so Adelaide's Adelaide's a tough nut, right? Adelaide's a really tough nut to crack. I actually went and lived up in Queensland because I was so sick of Adelaide and how difficult it was to get work and find opportunities that I left. And once I left, I realised that Adelaide was actually all right. So I came back and then this started getting really serious. So it's good that I did. Um, so seed funding for entrepreneurial pursuits, like just getting enough money to do the really basic stuff and get off the ground, that's quite hard to come by in Adelaide. Um, so that's one barrier that you'll hit. Um, so advice, this is my advice to you Adelaide entrepreneurs. Passion will win the game. So if you've got a good idea, basically everything's been thought of already, but if you stick with an idea for long enough, and you get to know your problem domain long enough, you'll eventually come up with something that's unique. But you have to be passionate enough to really stick at it. So there's sort of no easy way to quick, quick gains in this game. And it's just like any other business. Um, you have to put in the hard yards to find the gold, um, whatever that is. And your idea might really change, but that's okay. You've got to be prepared for that. I think being prepared to let go of ideas is important as well. If quite clearly there is no market need for your idea, then move on to something else. There's no point in pursuing it. I heard this story where on two separate instances, um, um, two different groups developed uh, a product in the manufacturing area for about $10 million each research, research money um, and they hadn't done any market research so they hadn't actually validated this product they'd done so $20 million was just busted on research and they hadn't actually seen whether there was a need for it. You don't want to be in that position, just don't go there. Um, be prepared to go through really tough times where you question everything. Um, it can be quite lonely um, and I think like just having trust and faith that you'll find the right people is really important. Um, there's a few sharks out there, so put on your put on your hats of um, awareness and wear them at all times. I would say like one of the biggest things for um, entrepreneurial type of um, pursuits is that advice and opinions are bound. Everyone will have an idea or opinion about what you need to do and your job is to be strong enough and smart enough to know which advice to take, how to take it and how to stay true to the problem you're solving. So, um, yeah, be prepared to learn a lot and to learn a lot about yourself as well, I think. Um, it's certainly, I would say, like one piece of advice is it's not about the money. So if you're, if you're being entrepreneurial and just trying to get an idea off the ground just to make money, it won't go anywhere. So you need to find more um, than, than finance as a motivator, basically. Um, but I'm sure you all already know that. So uh, any other advice? Well, there's a fair bit. There's lots of advice. But, you know, I think... Yeah, I think that's a good good chunk of advice to leave us with, with uh, leave my listeners with. And um, 
also all the other advice you mentioned throughout the interview, so there's lots there. Uh, mm -hmm. Stuart, thanks uh, a lot for coming on uh, and doing this interview with me. It's been really interesting picking your brain. For the Absolutely, last pleasure. Episode. Yeah, no, I've and, really enjoyed uh, it. No worries, and, and good luck with the, the, the launch and the rollout and uh, the business going forward. Absolutely, thank you. I will keep you updated. Cheers.